morning. Um, we have two grand rounds. Uh, Dr. Joel Saints leading off, I guess. And then Dr. Owens is next. Uh, our color of the day will be red. Um, and uh, Dr. Joel Saint will be uh, discussing interprosthetic femur fractures this morning. So Joseph, come on up. Or do you have an announcement? Yeah, just Never mind, there's an announcement. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, for those of you who weren't at AOS um, last week, I wanted you to know about um, a pretty monumental achievement of the group here. Um, Mike Bossi accepted the Kappa Delta Award, which is the, the top academic research award in all of orthopedics on behalf of the metric group. So many of our trauma attendings here are, and many of our research attendings here are co-authors on that work. So that was, that was a real neat achievement. So I want everybody to know about that. Also very proud of our residents. We had four resident podiums at the meeting. And if you look overall at the um, performance of the group, we had 32 presentations and we had 16 posters. So really, if you look at that as that ranks nationally, that's really right up there at the very top. So I'm very proud of the achievement. I wanted to, didn't want to let it go without um, making that um, available to everybody who didn't know about it. So congratulations, guys. Give yourself a round. All right, no further ado. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Joseph Jolson, as was stated, and uh, today we're going to be talking about interprosthetic femur fractures. Here's our agenda for today, and as always, we will start with cases. Um, so our case one is a 77-year-old female who had a ground-level fall. Um, she's got a past surgical history of bilateral total hip and knee arthroplasties, and you can see her exam there. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, she sustained a left interprosthetic femur fracture. And even more unfortunately, she had a matched fracture on the contralateral side. Uh, case two is a 74-year-old male who, fought, who fell off a ladder uh, cleaning gutters. Um, he's got a past medical history of BPH and prostate cancer and a past surgical history of a right total hip and knee arthroplasty. Um, and you can see his exam there. As you can see, he sustained a right interprosthetic femur fracture in the setting of a stemmed total knee arthroplasty. Case three is a 53-year-old female who had a fall down the stairs. Um, she's got a past medical history of right total hip and knee arthroplasty. As you can see here, she unfortunately sustained a right interprosthetic femur fracture. And if you look closely at the lateral view of the knee, there's a concerning radiolucent line around the prosthesis. And finally, a 42 year old, uh, case four is a 42 year old female with a right femur bone sarcoma. She had childhood leukemia uh, and bone infarct secondary to her treatment. Um, unfortunately, she developed a secondary bone uh, sarcoma in her femur. Uh, as you can see here, she has a history of a right total hip. However, she has a heterogeneously enhancing distal femur mass that based on biopsy is a sarcoma and extends about 17 centimeters proximal to the joint. Um, after shared decision making, she's going to undergo uh, endoprosthetic reconstruction. So femoral fractures between the total knee arthroplasty and the total hip arthroplasty is known, are known as interprosthetic femur fractures. And these are becoming more common as life expectancy increases and the number of patients who have undergone ipsilateral total hip and knee arthroplasty continues to rise. Interprosthetic fractures are challenging clinical problems and are reported to complicate around 9% of ipsilateral total hip and knee arthroplasties. Interprosthetic fractures are rare, but more complex to treat surgically than isolated periprosthetic fractures because the joint arthroplasties on either side of the fracture may impede the quality of fixation obtained. Uh, furthermore, interprosthetic fractures may be more prone to delayed healing due to compromised intramedullary blood supply secondary to prior reaming of the femoral canal, and in some cases, the presence of bone cement within the canal. In 1995, David all first reported on the open fixation of an interprosthetic femur fracture, and shortly after, Kenny et al. reported on a series of four. Uh, all four patients experienced failure of fix fracture fixation, and two patients required above-knee amputations. Uh, the authors cautioned readers at that time about the poor outcomes associated with these complex injuries, especially in patients with a stemmed total knee implant. Um, and since these early reports, the management of interprosthetic femur fractures has improved tremendously with the development of superior orthopedic implants and a better understanding of the complexity of these injuries. And as these fractures severity was recognized and as they became more prevalent, it created an opportunity for collaboration between orthopedic trauma surgeons and adult reconstru reconstructive surgeons. Uh, many of these fractures require the use of fracture principles to achieve stable fixation and union, while many others 
uh, require revision orthoplasty principles. And the ideal treatment and success of these injuries requires a thorough understanding of both. Um, and our understanding of these injuries has evolved over the years. And as we've understood them more fully, uh, classifications have been developed. Um, early classifications were just modifications of, of classifications we already had. Uh, both Fink and Sonnen modified the Vancouver classification to include these injuries. Uh, Fink et al. modified the Vancouver classification to describe if their fracture was around the hip or knee implant. And Sonnen proposed further modifications to the Vancouver and Softcock classifications to include fractures around a stemmed total knee implant, as this was recognized as a more difficult fracture pattern. Finally, Dr. Pires and colleagues published a novel and comprehensive classification system for interprosthetics that reflects the location of the fracture, the stability of the implant, um, and the presence or absence of, a, for absence of a stemmed revision knee prosthesis. And this system is the only one that is not a modification or an extension of an existing periprosthetic classification. And similar to the management of periprosthetic fractures, the management of interprosthetic inter fractures depends on um, the location of the fracture, the stability of the implant, and the ability to achieve stable fracture fixation. Um, and in this classification, each of these are taken into account. I will also add that in, in addition to these three points, it's important um, to know the type of implant that the patient has is that that may dictate uh, uh, different operative management. And we'll discuss why later in this talk. The type one fractures are, are surround the total hip prosthesis. Subtype A indicates that both prostheses are stable. Subtype B denotes an unstable hip prosthesis and a stable knee. Subtype C is a stable hip and an unstable knee. And subtype D is a fracture where both prostheses are unstable. Type two fractures um, or interprosthetic femur fractures surrounding the knee are the most common type of interprosthetic femur fracture, um, specifically 2A where both prostheses are stable. And as you can see, the subtypes A through D uh, are the same as type one fractures. Type three are interprosthetic fractures in the setting of a stemmed total knee, um, like stem total knee orthoplasty or revision style distal femur. Um, and this has its own subtype because as you can see on that picture to the right, a stem distally in the femoral canal brings its own set of fixation challenges. Uh, subtype A is where both prostheses are stable. There is viable bone. Uh, B is where both are stable, but there's not viable bone for fixation. Subtype D, C is where either component is unstable and there's viable bone. And then D is where either component is unstable uh, and there is not viable bone. So this is a comprehensive treatment algorithm published by the same group to use when approaching interprosthetic femur fractures. And don't worry about the busyness of the slide. We'll go through it now and you'll see plenty of it throughout the rest of the talk to ensure by the end we all have a grasp on how to approach this difficult problem. Uh, we discussed that type one and two fractures are between a total hip and a primary style total knee. And in the setting of stable implants, AKA, AKA type one A or type two A, uh, the preferred treatment is with a locking plate. Uh, you can see that I added plus or minus an inch medullary nail to this algorithm. Uh, there's been some recent interest in nail plating <laughs> interprosthetic femur fractures uh, where the pattern is amenable and we'll touch base on some of that literature later in the talk. Uh, in the setting of an interprosthetic fracture where either an unstable hip or knee component, uh, we then transition to orthoplasty principles and have to move to revision options with long stems with or without a supplemental plate. Um, as we discussed, type three are fractures in the setting of a stemmed total knee implant and a total hip. Um, and if the implants are stable, the preferred treatment is with locked plating. And as we know, because of the stem total knee, an inch medullary nail is not an option here. In the setting of a type three fracture with unstable implants, we again move to revision orthoplasty principles, although we then have to consider bigger revision options such as an interposition sleeve. And then finally, if there are unstable implants and insufficient bone stock, the only viable option in terms of keeping the limb is to consider a total femur. So with that foundation, let's dive into some of the evidence. Uh, this study had a rush, looked at 22 patients with an interprosthetic femur fracture, uh, treated with a single locked plate, and all 22 went on to union. They had no failures. Uh, patients were kept touchdown weight bearing for an average of nine weeks prior to progressing to full weight bearing. They emphasized in their study that there was minimal soft tissue dissection, and you'll see that emphasized in the next study as well. Uh, I do want to say that this is an important point. Uh, oftentimes in the setting of an interprosthetic femur fracture, the end osteal blood supply uh, is compromised by cementation or prior reaming. In that setting, you're relying solely on uh, periosteal blood supply. Uh, this study out of HSS looked at a cohort of 26 interprosthetic femur fractures treated with plate fixation that spanned the inter entire interprosthetic zone, meaning it overlapped the stem proximally and the knee component distally. You'll notice they also emphasized the use of biologic tissue preserving plating techniques. 
Um, all fractures healed after the index procedure. The average time the weight bearing is tolerated, however, was 13 weeks, and there were three mild unions. And they concluded that modern biologic plating techniques that span the entire interprosthetic zone um, show reliable union rates without the use of any bone graft. A similar study out of the UK looked at 49 fractures, but that group actually allowed most of the patients to weight bear immediately postoperatively, recognizing that one of the downsides of isolated plate fixation is a tendency for surgeons to restrict weight bearing for a prolonged period of time. In those prior two studies, it was nine to 13 weeks. Um, and they had a 91% union rate indicating that maybe we can push the limits of weight bearing protocols in some of these patients, even in the setting of isolated plate fixation. And as we know, based on those results, um, plate fixation is widely accepted treatment, uh, but what length, plate, what length plate should we use? Um, this biomechanical study by Walter et al. published in the Journal of Arthroplasty tried to establish a safe distance of the plate from the tip of the femoral prosthesis. They took 38 femurs and created an osteoporotic bone model. Uh, a hip stem was cemented into each and a distal femoral plate applied with the distance to the stem varying from eight centimeters apart to six centimeters of overlap and two centimeters of in two centimeter increments. Um, each specimen was tested in cyclic axial loading and torsion, and each femur was axially loaded to failure. Uh, strain increased with decreasing overlap or gap, and seven specimens failed early between two centimeters overlap and two centimeters gap. Um, revol results were divided into a far group with a distance of greater than four centimeters and a close group, which was less. Um, and strain was significantly higher in the close group uh, for axial and torsional loading, and failure load was significantly higher. And based on this study, they recommended that a gap or overlap between the stem and the plate should be at least six, cent six centimeters in osteoporotic bone. But you'll also note that the study design, six centimeters overlap was the longest that they did. So they didn't really study anything longer. Um, a publication out of the European Hip Society looked at the same issue. Uh, they performed a biomechanical study with a cemented hip stem and a lateral plate. Um, each construct was subjected to torsion, axial compression, and three-point lateral bending. And they concluded that optimal plate fixation is achieved by extending a lateral femoral plate at least two shaft diameters proximal to the tip of the stem and using a spread of proximal screws. Uh, Dr. Schwarzkopf out of NYU published a review on this topic in the Yellow Journal in 2017, and he referenced that aforementioned literature and ultimately stated that this rec recommendation represents a minimum length and that the plate should span most, if not the entire length of the femur to decrease the risk of another fracture and maximize fixation opportunities. So as can be seen based on the literature, locked plating is a great option. And with appropriate surgical technique, union can reliably be achieved. Uh, one potential downside is a prolonged non-weight bearing status, often dictated by plate fixation. Um, however, in interprosthetic fractures with stable implants, there has been recent interest in retrograde nailing combined with plating, which could offer the benefit of earlier weight bearing. Uh, a study out of JOT in 2018 evaluated retrograde intramedullary nailing combined with plate fixation, um, again, emphasizing the tissue preserving plating techniques. And the authors utilized this technique in a series of nine patients with inner prosthetics. Um, each patient initiated weight bearing is tolerated immediately after operative intervention. Every fracture healed at an average of 20 weeks. And they concluded that the use of a lateral locked plate combined with a retrograde nail enables immediate post-op weight bearing and stable fixation. As stated earlier, it's also imperative to identify the implants that the patient currently has. Or retrograde nailing combined with lateral plating is a viable often option. It's, it's often difficult to ascertain which components will be compatible with intramedullary nailing because the femoral component design and intercontinental distance is highly variable. Um, given that growing interest, Thompson et al. published a compatibility guide in, in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2014 of all the total knee components that were currently in use at the time in order to empower surgeons. And uh, given the continued interest and in growing use of this plate nail construct, um, an updated guide was published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2022 um, to kind of update to all the newer designs. Um, so in summary, stable type one and two interprosthetic femur fractures can be treated via locked plating or a nail plate construct, depending on if the fracture pattern is amenable and the comfortability of the surgeon. As a quick review before moving on, we now know this is a type one A fracture, meaning around a total hip with a stable stem. Um, and based on our algorithm, it should be treated with a locked plate. And ultimately, this was the final construct. Uh, we now know this is a type 2A, which is the most common type of interprosthetic fracture, meaning around a stemless total knee with stable implants. And we know that this can be treated either with a locked plate or a nail plate combo. Uh, this patient had a nail plate combo, and these are her x-rays one year postoperatively. 
Well, less common, what about technical considerations for, for uh, situations with lack of suitable bone stock or unstable implants? Um, as we discussed previously, in these situations, we often transition from fracture principles to arthroplasty principles because commonly a revision is needed. As you can see here, this is a type 2C uh, interprosthetic femur fracture, meaning around a total knee with an unstable knee prosthesis. Um, and as we know, based on our treatment algorithm, this should be fixed with a revision to a DFR. And here, here are post-op x-rays. Um, but what are some technical considerations for these patients? Sonnen et al. performed an excellent biomechanical study to determine a safe distance between a stemmed total knee and total hip. Um, they created seven femur models, an intact femur and six replaced models with a total hip arthroplasty and varying lengths of a stemmed total knee arthroplasty. Uh, risk for femur fracture was determined, determined and compared for several activities using a finite element modeling technique. Um, during gait and sideways falling, no difference can risk for fracture among different stem lengths was shown. Um, however, a clear threshold was identified during four point bending and stem tip distances shorter than 110 millimeters dramatically increased the risk for fracture. Um, and they concluded that an osteoporotic bone, which is most of these patients, a stem tip, stem tip distance less than 11 centimeters could certainly lead to fracture and thus should be avoided. Uh, interestingly, a study published the next year in the Bone and Joint Journal evaluated the role of interprosthetic distance, cortical thickness, and bone mineral density in interprosthetic fractures. And, and I'm gonna present this paper mostly so we're comprehensive in the literature. Um, they found that the fracture force of all three groups was similar, and there was a highly significant correlation between the cortical area and the fracture strength, whereas bone density showed no influence. They concluded that this suggests that the interprosthetic distance has little influence on fracture strength in interprosthetic femur fractures, and that the thickness of the cortex seems to be the decisive factor. Interestingly, um, if you look at their results, they noted an in increasing force to fracture as the interprosthetic gap distance increases. Uh, the minimum fracture force of the 160 millimeter group was almost twice that of the 35 millimeter group. And they reported that this, however, was due to different thickness of the courses and not to the different interprosthetic distance. Um, and we can see these principles at play here and applied in this patient with an interprosthetic femur fracture and minimal distal bone stock. Um, given the concern for increased risk of fracture between the stems, a lateral plate was used to overlap both stems. And finally, what are some technical, technical considerations for the ex extremely challenging type three with either unviable bone or an unstable prosthesis? Um, as we discussed earlier, options are limited to either some sort of interposition sleeve or a total femur construct. Um, these fractures with long stem implants and poor bone stock pose a considerable sur surgical challenge and they are a rare subtype of an already rare fracture type. And as such, there's really limited data on their treatment. Um, Satak et al. published their results of four custom interposition prostheses with a follow-up of eight years. Uh, three were successfully treated and one was revised secondary to loosening. And they stated that due to their encouraging results with this interposition device, uh, we believe it's a valuable treatment option for interprosthetic femoral fractures. Uh, this is an example of the aforementioned interposition sleeve. Cement is placed inside the sleeve on either side and the two, ste the two stems are, are linked in that manner. And that's to avoid the, the dissection with a total femur, for example. Um, again, but these are pretty rare injuries. Um, Patel et al. published their results of custom cement-linked megaprostheses in, in a series of 15 patients. And their survival rate was 93.3 at a mean follow-up of 5.3 years, which isn't that long of time considering. Um, they had one revision and they presented that as a, as a salvage technique with good intermediate term outcomes for, for patients with complex periprosthetic femoral fractures and another option. Um, specifically, it allows immediate weight bearing and avoids some of the morbidity of a total femur or an amputation. This was an example of the megaprostheses used in that study. Finally, in the most severe of cases, the only option in preserving a limb is a total femur. Uh, Freesick et al. evaluated 100 total femurs for revision arthroplasty, of which 39 uh, were done secondary to periprosthetic fracture, and the mean follow-up was five years. 32% of the patients in that study had significant complications. Uh, deep infection was found in 12 patients, dislocation in six, material failure in three, patellar problems in two, and a pair of neural nerve palsy in one. So in the setting, while, while total femur may be the only limb preserving option, uh, the complication profile is significant, as is the injury. I'm sure everyone in the audience now has information overload, so uh, let's bring it back to where we started and, and summarize. Uh, so here's our treatment algorithm once again. With regards to type one or two fractures, if the implants are stable, preferred uh, treatment option is locked plating or intramedullary nailing plus locked plating. 
If our implants are unstable, we transition to revision arthroplasty principles with revision to a long stemmed implant. Type three fractures are between a total hip and a stemmed total knee. In the setting of stable implants, the treatment of choice is again a locked plate. In the setting of unstable implants in a type three fracture, we transition to revision arthroplasty principles in the use of long stem implants or interposition sleeves. Um, and in the setting of poor bone stock and unstable implants, your only limb salvage option is a total femur implant, which comes with high morbidity. So with that, let's get back to the cases. Uh, case one was our 77 year old female who had the bilateral total hip and knee arthroplasties. We now know this is a type 2A interprosthetic femur fracture, meaning around a stemless total knee with stable implants. And as we know, she had a the same fracture on the contralateral side. Um, given her age um, and you know her need to be able to be weight bearing postoperatively, we elected to uh, treat this with her with a with a nail plate construct on both sides, as that would allow her to weight bear. And this is her uh, one year post op X-rays on the right side and then the left side. Case two is our seventy four year old male who fell off of the ladder cleaning gutters. We now know this is a type 3A interprosthetic femur fracture, uh, meeting around a uh, stemmed total knee with a total hip. Um, and as you can see, there's no really room in the intramedullary canal. So the, the preferred treatment in stable implants is a locked plate. Um, and as can be seen here, this patient was treated with lag screws and locked lateral plate. And we ensured to overlap the femoral stem by six centimeters per that study. Uh, case three was our 53 year old female who fell down the stairs. Um, we now know this is a type 2C fracture, meaning around a total knee with an unstable knee prosthesis as indicated uh, by the radiolucent line on the lateral view. And based on our algorithm, this should be treated with a revision, long stemmed arthroplasty plus or minus a plate based on stem length and interprosthetic distance. Um, she entered with this DFR construct and, and uh, care was taken to leave 11 centimeters based on that study by Sonnen et al. published in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2013. Had that interprosthetic distance be had, had that been shorter, uh, you know, consideration would have been for a uh, lateral plate as was presented earlier. In case four, our 42 year old patient with a bone sarcoma, uh, she, she elected to undergo resection and interprosthetic reconstruction and realizing the risk for interprosthetic fracture and realizing that the only options in that event, if she had a fracture would be total femur replacement or amputation. Her surgeon placed the prophylactic lateral plate. Um, so in summary, interprosthetic femur fractures are complex and challenging. They require both fracture and arthroplasty principles. Um, algorithms can guide our treatment. And within those algorithms, you need to know the location, stability of the implant, and your ability to achieve fracture fixation. Um, as I said, you need to know your implants as that can dictate your treatment. And then type three interprosthetics uh, with poor bone stock or unstable prostheses are unique and complex challenge. You have very few options, those being interposition sleeves or total femurs, which have a high complication rate. A uh, big thank you to everyone who helped with this talk and for all of the cases. And with that, I will take any questions. Joseph, well, well organized and well presented, thanks. Um, one of the things um, that was in my mind is, is back in the day, um, we used a lot more circlage wires. Mm -hmm. And I know there, there are more sophisticated ways of doing that now with tape and other things, but I don't see many of these constructs um, augmented by by that. Is, is that falling out of favor for vascular reasons or other things, or why are we not using more? We still use a lot of circlage wires. If, if if fixation is just a lateral plate, I'll go back to this x-ray, um, then the treatment of choice is locked, locked lateral plate, usually with, um, this one didn't have it, um, usually with circlage wires or um, lag screws. So I'm trying to go back to this case, but we know we often do use circlage wires if it's just a lateral plate. If you combine it with a nail, then that, then most people with a with a nail do not use circlage wires. There's one right there. So you can see this one had three circlage wires. Um, so if you have either a stem total knee and all you can do is put a lateral plate on, then yes, a lot of times we do use circlage wires with a locked lateral plate. Um, if you do, if you're going to put a retrograde nail up, we forego the use of the the uh, circlage wires because the, the nail kind of centers everything. Um, but yeah, no, we still use it. Yeah, just with biologic friendly techniques. Well, that was very complete. It's great. Uh, you didn't mention bone grafting. And uh, tell me where you get those sleeves at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> you, 
<laughs> uh, I didn't mention bone grafting because a lot of the uh, a lot of the papers with locked plating, um, you know, they basically they presented that if you use this 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 uh, technique where you preserve the biology or the soft tissue, that you don't have to use bone grafting, and that was mentioned in their studies. Or or with the nail plate contract, you don't have to use bone grafting. Obviously, in these bigger defects, bigger problems, you know, bone grafting could be a consideration. Um, those those custom prostheses. Let me go to the end. The reason they actually made them um, is because you don't need to have them custom made. Um, it's just a sleeve, as you can see here, and you put cement on either side. But yes, if you have a fracture where the only option is a, a total femur, then you get into bigger issues, and that can only be really treated at a center like this, you know, where you have those options. Which shelf do they keep those on? I guess I was asking. Whenever I was uh, laying there in bed. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to tell me which shelf they keep them on. I'm, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure they're approved for routine use. Yeah, I'm sure you can go through the FDA and then six months from now you can get one. Yeah.